Man, I thought during that second song, for a second, I thought Camden's guitar was going to make Addie go into labor. <laughs> it was good. I loved it. But I just, you know, just had this scenario in my head because she's two weeks out from her due date. And she's on the front row. And I just thought, you know, she could, like, scream out in pain. And, and we would all think she's just full of the spirit, you know? <laughs> like, oh, look at Addie, man. Addie's, Addie's worshiping God. No, she's not. Her water broke. Anyway, but it didn't happen, so we're okay, all right? But anyway, uh, I'm so glad that you guys are here. Um, I love to spend August uh, kind of casting some vision, right? I, it's like a coach's meeting, okay? And so this is, this is the last uh, little, I guess, coach's meeting that we'll have for a little bit. And then in the fall, like I said, we're going to do a series on faith for six weeks. And then we're going to do a, a series on friendship for six weeks, what it looks like to have a good friend, how to make friends, how to keep friends. Uh, and then it'll be Christmas, uh, which we're really excited about. That's always a happening, uh, a hopping season around here. But last year, both myself Pastor Ashley and pa Pastor Carrie, we all went to separate conferences in separate places, and we all came back with the same message. Every conference that we went to, uh, whether it was for children's, youth, uh, adult ministry, whatever it was, they all had the same warning, and the warning was this, buckle in for next gen, buckle in for next gen. Gen. And what they were talking about specifically was Gen Z and Gen Alpha. And I'm not so sure, I'm, I'm not, no, don't know if you're familiar with Gen Z and Gen Alpha and who Gen Z is and who Gen Alpha is, but I want to explain it a little bit to you. So Gen Z and Gen Alpha, this would be kind of the, the age category that they would fall into, okay? So, so a lot of us are, you know, you, you might be Gen, Gen X, Gen Y, Gen, you know, Boomer Sooner, whatever it may be, okay? Uh, but and a lot of us are millennials, you know, there's millennials in the house too, right? Basically, you know, if you, it depends. Did you grow up on rock and roll or Backstreet Boys? That's the divide, okay? But Gen Z, Gen Z right now would be between the age of 11 and 24, Okay? Born kind of uh, the 2000s, early 2000s is what we would say, you know, maybe late, late 90s. But Gen Z, they're between the ages of 11 and 24. And then the generation behind them is Gen Alpha. And Gen Alpha would be about the age of, of 10 and below. So a lot of our kids in the children's department or a lot of your children or grandchildren would be considered uh, Gen Alpha. Now, here's the thing. This generation is different than any other generation we've ever seen. That's what the warnings are telling us. They're letting us know, hey, look, this generation has a whole lot of strengths, but they also have a whole lot of complications. And there are going to be challenges with them that we've never seen before, things that parents aren't ready for, that grandparents aren't ready for, that the culture isn't ready for. And so we've got to buckle in for next gen and understand the needs of this generation because it's going to change everything. And so I want to start with talking about some of their strengths, okay? Because there, there are a ton of strengths uh, with, with this generation, and specifically Gen Z, because we don't know a whole lot about Gen Alpha, okay? They're still very, very young. There's some research that's beginning to start, but Gen Z specifically, we're learning a lot about. So I want to tell you some of the strengths of Gen Z. So, so these are some of their strengths. They're the first true digital generation, okay? They do everything online, my kids, they don't have textbooks. They have an iPad and a stylus. That's what they have. I mean, they know how to do everything. They, they got, you know, cell phones way earlier than most of us did, which their cell phones now aren't like our, you know, Motorola flip phones that we had or, you know, some of those backpacks or, you know, that you guys carried around, okay? But they're, I mean, it's a computer. They basically have a computer at their hand at a very, very young age, tablets and everything. And so they know how to do everything online. They know how to set up Zoom meetings, they have emails, they know how to text, they know how to do all of this stuff. So just stop going to Geek Squad at Best Buy and just give it to your six-year-old and they will probably be able to fix it for you because they're the first true all digital generation. The other thing is they're the best educated generation yet. So this generation statistically is less likely to drop out of high school than any generation we've ever seen. 
And a big part of that is the other thing about this generation is they're the most diverse generation we've ever seen. And with that, especially in the Latino culture and the Latino community, a lot of their generations in the past didn't graduate high school, didn't go to college, and that's changing. Because of the way that our country, especially in America, is developing and opening itself up and becoming more diverse, there's more opportunities for minorities to go to school, to finish school, to get uh, loans for college and stuff and and different things like that. So especially in the Latino uh, culture, this is actually changing. We're seeing a generation of Latinos who are graduating high school, the first generation to graduate high school, the first generation to get a college degree. So they're actually one of the best educated uh, generations that we've ever seen. And then the other thing is this, they're very self-driven. I mean, the entrepreneurship is there, okay? Which, which I know some of us, you know, I think all of us look at the generation behind us and like, oh, they're so lazy, blah, 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 blah. But honestly, statistically, it's just not true. This culture is, is more driven than one of the, any, really any other culture because they're, they're like starting businesses, they're driven. Uh, if they care about it, they're all in. And I mean, and they hit the gas. And so they're very, very self-driven and they deeply care about others. This generation is, is deeply rooted in, in doing what's best for their neighbor, which is funny because... That's what the church has been saying for a long time, right? I mean, love your neighbor. And they're all about that. They're all about loving one another, taking care of one another, about equality, about social justice. I mean, they really do. They care about the environment. They care about others. They care about our planet. uh, And they care about social justice issues. And then the other thing is, like I just said, they're the most diverse generation yet. So there are so many good things. And especially at all my conferences I went to, they're like, man, This generation was made to partner with the church. I mean, this generation, they are self-driven. They will jump in. One of the things that they talked about at these conferences is they're looking for, they they don't care what age you are. They just want you to be genuine. As long as you are genuine and you are real with them, they will trust you. That is what they are looking for. They want to be able to know that they can trust you. But boy, if they do, they will partner with you. And if you're doing something for others, if you're doing something in the community, if you're doing something to answer a need, they will love you, they will partner you, and they will invest back in you, which is great. Now, here are the challenges. And I'm not going to call them weaknesses. I don't want to do the whole strengths and weaknesses things. These are their challenges because challenges can be overcome. Weaknesses you can't do much about, okay? But these are their challenges. They're anxious, they're the most anxious, which, oh, did you hear that? All the Gen Z's went, oh, geez. Yeah. He's talking about me. I got anxious just him saying that, okay? They're anxious. They are. They're the most anxious generation. They're the most anxious generation we've ever seen. And along with that, they're worried about the future. Now, let me tell you something. This makes complete sense when you understand what this generation has been through. This generation, since they've been born, we've been at war with somebody, or there's been threat of nuclear war, or World War III, or the world is ending, or something. I mean, that has been their entire lives. Not just that, but pandemics, and problems, and the world, because of technology, has gotten so small. I mean, you know of every single thing under the sun that you possibly need to fear, right? And that's different than past generations. And so now we have all of these things we're told to fear, and especially in the media, we're told, you know, here's the newest thing to be afraid of, right? I mean, fear is a money machine now. And so this generation has grown up almost being entertained with fear. And so they're thrown all of these new things to be afraid of, but also, too, they don't trust anyone. Which rightfully so. Because again, we live in a world where nothing that is private doesn't go public. I mean, whether it be a tweet that you made 15 years ago or a scandal or something that you thought would be kept a secret, in this world today, there is nothing that's done private that doesn't go public. And so now we have all of these, you know, documentaries and scandals and stuff, you know, you you take, you know, especially in the church world, uh, Hillsong or, you know, certain pastors and stuff. And so now what's happened is that this generation, they don't trust the government, they don't trust the pharmaceutical industry, they don't trust doctors, they don't trust teachers. They don't trust coaches, and they don't trust the church. And I get it, because there's a lot of stories out there that have been uncovered of people who were given power and responsibility and authority, and they misused it. And the statistics with this, there's been several different studies that have shown kind of how they're dealing with this, and they said that 71%, 71% of Gen Z worries about their future. 
And 97%, 97% said that they felt burnt out and stressed out. 97% said they felt burnt out and stressed out. Which I know like you and I, we look at that and go, well, what are you so stressed out about? <laughs> You're not even married yet. You don't even have kids yet. You don't even have a career yet. But the truth is, is that that is how they feel because of everything else that's just going on in their world, with their health, with their finances. They just feel like they can't catch a break, and they're just constantly afraid. Now, the other thing is that their engagement is declining as well. Their social engagement. Because we live in a world with remote work, and it's all about the dollar, and it's all about getting things done, we're, we're raising a generation that doesn't know how to socially interact with other people. They're so much in their digital world, which is a strength, but they're so much in their digital world that when they come face to face with a person, they don't know what to do. Sometimes, in some cases, they can't even look you in the eye. The confidence just isn't there. But along with the workplace and everything else, uh, BetterUp did a study, and they found that 33%, 33% of Gen Z are satisfied with their social relationships. So even this generation knows, I don't have many friends. I am not connecting with other people. 22%, 22% of people claim to have one friend at work. 22%. 22% said, I have one friend at work. And 48%, 48% of Gen Z on this study that BetterUp did reported 48% said that they felt like their relationships were transactional and not genuine. Which some of you who are parents have, if you have a teenager or if you have a young adult in your house, how many times have you gone in there and been like, hey, what's up? And what did they say? What do you want? What do you want? What do you want? What do you want? Nothing. Can I not just be in the room? But here's the thing. It's because they're used to that. Because all, half, half of them feel like their relationships are transactional. We're, because the only reason you would interact with me or connect with me is because you want something from me. Does that make sense now? Yeah. So that's what they're used to at school. That's what they're used to with their friends. That's what they're used to in their group. It's a lot of this in the digital world. And if there's any reason to look up, it's just because somebody is looking for something from me. To trade something with me or to get something out of me. So that's this generation. That is what is coming. In every single conference that we went to, we all came back and we all shared our notes. Me, Pastor Ashley, Pastor Kerry, we sat down. What did you learn? And everybody had the same information. We have a storm coming. We have a generation that's ahead of us that none of us are really prepared for. And we have to get ready. We have to be in. Be in for next gen. And so here's my goal for today. My goal today is to inform you of what's going on, but my, my goal today is also to persuade you to partner with us, to be in for Next Gen. Because those conferences took place a year ago, and since then, we have been on a mission to restructure our, our culture, to restructure our ministry, to do what we need to do in order to reach the next generation. And we need your help. But before I do that, I want to tell you a story. So Jesus, after his death on the cross and his resurrection three days later, he sits the disciples down and he gives them the mission to go and make disciples. We talked about this a little bit last week. And he says, go and make disciples. And then he leaves, right? And so the disciples, what they do next? They had to carry out the mission. And so they went into the streets of Jerusalem preaching the good news and telling people that their Savior, that people had just recently seen die in the streets, die on a cross in front of everybody, horrifically, publicly, that actually he did not remain dead. That three days later, he rose again, and they had seen him, they had had breakfast with him, and that, that, that promise of eternal life was being passed on to us, and that Jesus was exactly who he said he was. He was God in human form. He was God on earth. And man, I'm telling you, if death can't beat him, then nothing else will. 
And so they go into Jerusalem, and this is in the middle of a, of a huge festival that's going on. There's all these different people, people from Galilee, people from Judah, all these people are here in Jerusalem. And so it, word gets back to the high priests and the Sadducees and the very same people that put Jesus to death. They thought that they had dealt with this group. This group was seen as a cult, and they thought if we kill his leader, they will disperse, they will run, they will be scared to death. But then they find out, oh my goodness, they're not running, they're not scared, and they're back, and they're still preaching and teaching in his name. And so when we look at the, the book of Acts, right, and the book of Acts was written by Luke. Luke was very uh, specific about, you know, what he put together, and he basically in the book of Acts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, right there, we get kind of the history of what happened after Jesus ascended into heaven, kind of the history of the first generation church. And so in Acts chapter 5, this is what Luke tells us. He says, then the high priests and all their associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. Now, when it says jealousy, jealousy probably isn't the most accurate uh, word here because what it was is they were afraid is what they were. They're like, man, we thought we put this guy to death. We thought his people would run. And now they're here and people are listening. I mean, come on, I thought we were putting this thing down. There's no way that this could grow. But it did. It started to grow. It started to take off. Even though they were on the run for their life, even though they were being hunted, this thing started to grow. And it, it made them jealous. It made them envious. But it just kind of turned their heart. It upset them is what happened. And so it says next that they went and arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. Now, I know many of you have been to jail, okay? Yeah, I knew that. And then I know. I, I'm on your Facebook, okay? Um, some of you have been in jail. Some of you have put people in jail, okay? Maybe that's why we turn the lights off, because some of you may recognize each other. Anyway, but when you think of jail, it's not like how you think of jail, okay? If you think of jail back then, jail was a hole in the ground, okay? So think hole in the ground with no plumbing or piping, okay? And there have been people in there before you. Okay, I have a weak stomach. I won't go any further, okay? But it wasn't a pleasant experience. It wasn't a good thing. You're put in a dark hole with no lights, and, 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 and there's no plumbing or anything like that. And so that's what happened. They, they put them in there, and then the next morning, they were going to put them on trial. But God ends up springing them out, breaking them out, and so now they're out of jail. Now, I want you to just think about this for a minute. If you were arrested by the same people that put your Savior to death, and then God sprung you out, the, 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 in the middle of the night before they could, you know, put you on trial and quite possibly uh, crucify you and put you to death, what would you do? I know what I would do. I would go home, okay? I'd be like, whew, thank you, God. All right, well, look, we'll pick this up. Maybe when things calm down just a little bit, you know? But that's not what happened. The very next day, the very next day, they go back into Jerusalem, and this time they go to the temple, they go to the center of the religious people's offices, a place that they were not even allowed in, and they go into the temple and start to, again, preach and teach about Jesus. And so the Sadducees catch up with them, and they're like, guys, what are you doing? We told you guys not to do this. And so they arrest them again. And then they say this. They go, we gave you strict orders not to teach in his Name That was very specific. Stop talking about Jesus, okay? Like, I don't know, just like, don't mention Jesus. Stop teaching his name. You're making us look bad. And they said, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teachings and are determined to make us guilty for this man's blood. And that was the breaking point for Peter. When Peter heard that, he said, uh-uh, not today. Uh-oh, no, 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 hold on. Make you feel guilty? We're making you feel bad? Stop it because you're making us feel bad? You guys are the ones that killed them. I'm sorry if it makes you feel bad. And so Peter gets up and he makes this big speech, this big sermon, and just rips them a new one. Just goes full on WWE, Stone Cold Steve Austin on these Sadducees. And you can read it for yourself, okay? That's your assignment this week. Go and read that. But I'll give you the cliff notes. The cliff notes are, you killed them. God raised them. We've seen them. Now say you're sorry. That was the sermon, all right? You killed them. We saw them. 
We, God raised him. You've seen him. We've seen him. Say you're sorry. And they, he, says, he even says them. He goes, you tried to kill the author of life and failed. You tried to kill the author of life, but God raised him back. So repent. Repent and turn and kneel and invite him to be the savior of your life as well. Make him the king of your life because the kingdom of God has come. And so this really upset the Sadducees. So you know what they did? They flogged them. Which a lot of us, we don't know what floggings are. I think the most accurate depiction, I remember early 2000s when The Passion of the Christ came out. I've never watched it since. I just can't. You know, I mean, but just, just that part alone is worth watching to understand what Jesus went through. I remember I saw it in theaters and just cried. I've, I've never been able to watch it since. Most horrific, most, I, I would think, accurate you know, depiction of, of what happened to Jesus. And so this is what happens to them. They're taken and they're beat. Their backs are, are, are beat with whips and pieces of glass and all kinds of stuff. And you got to understand, I mean, these men would, would be just cut all over their body, buckets of blood. I mean, just a horrific, horrific scene. And they did this because they knew. I mean, once this happened to you, not only were you hurt, but your life was kind of on the line because you you had to worry about infection and getting sick. And so you had to go seek medical attention just so you wouldn't die. And so they thought, well, this is a perfect answer because these guys, no matter what we do, they won't stop. No jail will hold them. So we'll just beat them within an inch of their life, and then they have to go home. So that's what they did. They beat them within an inch of their life. And these men beaten, bloodied, and bruised, probably put their arms around each other as brothers in Christ, carried each other home. But you know what happened? This is, this is the most weirdest verse you'll ever read. Some of you, you've never even read this in the Bible, and this will make you go, huh? This is the craziest thing you'll ever read. Luke says, the apostles left, left the Sanhedrin rejoicing. What? Rejoicing. Rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace. For who? For the name. See, here's the thing. They left that city excited, happy, rejoicing. Because for them, see, when it says that word suffering disgrace, what what would happen to them culturally You weren't flogged unless you were a criminal, okay? Flogging meant that you were a criminal. And these men, the the beating that they took, these men for the rest of their lives, if they ever took their shirt off to do anything, you would just see scars all over their back. And people, if they ever saw that, they would go, oh, this man's been to prison. That means this man has done something wrong, and he's a criminal. He's a bad guy. But they knew that. They knew that that's where those scars would be. And that it would be disgrace to the culture. But they thought it was a badge of honor. See, for them, that beating that they took, that sacrifice that they made, for them, it was a bookmark. Because for so many years when they were with Jesus, when stuff hit the fan, they ran. When things went wrong, when things went sideways, they literally abandoned Jesus. Literally on the day that Jesus was flogged and he was put on the cross, they denied him and said they didn't know him. But for the first time on their faith journey, they stood their ground, they looked the enemy in the face, and they said, no, you need to repent because my God is who I know he is. And they were beat for it, and they looked at it as a badge of honor. They thought, look at us. We did it. We took our whooping just like Jesus. Kind of makes us a little bit more like him, doesn't it? And they saw it as a badge of honor and something to rejoice about. And then you know what happened? They go home. They get their medicine. And then the very next verse says this. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Isn't that cool? Isn't that crazy? (laughs) So then, the Sanhedrin are scared to death. They're like, these are some bad man pajamas, man. Like, okay, well, 
y'all just do your thing then, you know? I mean, they just kind of backed off, you know? I mean, they were scared to death because these guys were not afraid of death. And what in the world would make you not afraid of death? I'll tell you, what would make you not fear even death is when you've seen your Lord and Savior tell you beforehand that he was going to die, but don't worry, he'll be raised three days later, and then it happens. When you witness that with your own eyes, you aren't scared of any beating you're going to get. Because at that point, as the song goes, as the hymn goes, death, where is your sting? You can do nothing to me. And so then they gather together, and then there was a problem, okay? It says this. It tells us an Acts. It informs us of what happened. In those days when the number of disciples were increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So in the middle of this festival, you had all of these people in town, okay? And they're starting to grow in numbers. I mean, the church is starting to kind of take off, even though it's still considered a cult and all of this stuff. But you had all these people coming in. You had people from Galilee, people from Judea, but you had... Jews, Hebra- you know, Hellenistic and Hebraic Jews, but you also had these Hellenistic Greeks. You had these Greeks. And the thing was, is that in the middle of Jerusalem, the Jews were very connected. They knew where to, where to get things, how to do it. And, and, and the church at the time, the disciples are preaching and teaching the word of God, but also they're trying to answer the needs of the community. And there was a large number of widows and children. And so they're preaching and teaching the word, but they're also taking, new, taking care of the community. And at that time, the problem was for widows and children. And so the Greeks come, and the Greeks didn't know where to go. It wasn't a racism thing or anything like that. They just weren't connected. So they didn't know what in the world they were supposed to do. And so you know what they did? They, the, 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 the church, the apostles, they said, okay, well, we got a problem here. So what they do? They did what every church does. They called the church meeting, Okay. Which, look, if you haven't grown up in the church or been around the church long, church meetings suck, okay? (laughs) The worst thing in the world. Nobody wants to do them, all right? All the leadership team here said amen, all right? We got staff meeting tomorrow night. Okay, we got a staff, we got a church meeting tomorrow night. Church meetings aren't fun, but that's what they did. So this is what it tells us. Luke says this. So so the 12 gathered, gathered all the disciples together, and they said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Now, that sounds so harsh. They're not saying that this is beneath them. What they're trying to say is, is that they were doing everything themselves, okay? They're trying to teach. They're trying to, to, to pray over people. They're trying to disciple people. And then at the same time, they're trying to distribute food. So basically, the 12 and the, this top you know, kind of line, they're, they're doing everything. And they're like, look, we can't do it all. Okay? We need to find a, brother, a, a, a different system. And so it says this. It says, brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom and we will turn this responsibility over to them so they have this big church meeting and they go you know what we just need to empower other people to do this there are other people who could do this job and probably do it better than us who are gifted in this way let's find some people who are full of the spirit who should take this over and then they say this and then that way we can give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word okay And here's what happens next. They have this church meeting, and they go, this is the plan. And then, for the first time, this very first big church meeting, this is what it says next. The proposal pleased the whole group. It has never happened in church history since. (laughs) Since this, 2,000 years ago, there has never been a church meeting where everyone left happy. Okay? First time it's happened, last time it's ever happened. But everybody thought, that's a great idea. So then they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and also a whole bunch of names that Pastor Mike can't pronounce. So, but it doesn't matter. Here's the point, okay? They get together this group, and Stephen, he was so good. He was such a good talker. He could run circles around the Sadducees. He could spit on the mic and just leave people's heads spinning. He was terrific. He was the perfect man, and he was organized. He was an entrepreneur. And so he takes on this task, and he ends up just flipping this whole thing, and it changes everything. They start feeding All of these people, all the Greeks, all the Jews, everybody's all together. And then all of a sudden, what it tells us next. And so the word of God spread. 
And the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now, don't let this just fly over your head. This is incredible. Not only did people start to grow in numbers and start, people started to follow Jesus, but even the Sadducees, even the very people who put Jesus to death, couldn't deny Jesus. And they, too, became followers of Jesus. Now, here's the thing. What does food distribution have to do with any of this? Let me tell you. They did what needed to be done in the moment, and that fueled a movement. They looked at the community and the needs of the community, and they did what needed to be done in the moment, and that fueled a movement. Now, what does this have to do with you? I'll tell you. Our organization has been around for 11 years. August, this is our anniversary. We started it in August. 11 years we've, we've been around. We got one church and two locations. Here in Troy, we have a campus that's about to go to two services. We got youth on Wednesday nights. We got small groups. Wright City, we got a service on Wednesday night. We're about to launch on September 10th that same night. We're going to launch youth in Wright City as well. And Ashley's going to run a youth program on Sunday nights in Wright City as well. And we have small groups that are starting out there. We've got two new small groups that are starting out there. So we've got one church in two locations. And we've got me. I'm full-time. Pastor Ashley, we've just brought her on full-time this last year. So Ashley's full-time. We've got Pastor Carrie and Pastor Wes. Pastor Carrie's part-time, but she's bivocational. She has a full-time job with the school. Wes is a teacher here in Troy. He's full-time with the school. We got Pastor Mike Lair, who's retired, who probably puts in 40 hours a week here at the church, and we don't pay him anything. We got CJ, who you saw here, who leads worship on Sundays. We have Kasia, who leads worship on Wednesday nights. And that's what we have. And then we have all of these environments for infants and children and teens and preteens. And we've started a, a new ministry for young adults. Last night, Pastor Ashley took our young adults. With the church bought two escape rooms. And so we took them and we locked a bunch of young people in with Ashley in an escape room. She even called me last night. She, Ashley's great. Don't we all love Ashley? Ashley's fantastic. Okay, calm down. I'm just kidding. She called me last night because uh, I had a meeting and she had a meeting. And so we were, we were sharing notes and stuff. And she goes, ah. Oh. I'm so sorry, because she, you know, she wants to, she, she's very good. She wants to do everything right. She goes, I'm so sorry. One of the escape rooms had a Ouija board. <laughs> I took a young adult to an escape room with a Ouija board. I said, let me tell you something. I have done way worse. You're fine. <laughs> You know, but we have a new ministry for our young adults. Ashley's going to lead a, a small group for our young adults. Kate and I, we're going to give them our house on Thursday nights. We're going to leave and go to CrossFit, and we're going to give the young adults our house so that they can uh, have uh, small groups with Ashley. So we have all of these environments, and, of course, we have environments for adults and stuff. And then you know about once a month, you know, we have a big community project. You guys just gave 215 book bags away, you know, two weeks ago. Savannah, I saw Savannah here. Where's Savannah at? Savannah, 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 Savannah back there. Savannah led the haircuts. Her and one of her friends did all of the haircuts that day and did a terrific job. So, you know, we're, we're, doing a, we're doing a big community project once a month, you know, affordable Christmas this year. We've done affordable Christmas. We, we've, we, this uh, last couple years, we've taken care of the entire school district here in Troy and put together an affordable Christmas shop for all the families that the counselor said are in need. This year, we're going to pull a hat trick, and we're going to do it not only in Troy, but we're going to do one in Wright City as well. And so we're partnering with the, the schools there in Wright City as well. We're going to do all kinds of stuff. So look, here's the thing. There's all these environments and stuff and all these things, and you've seen all the things we're trying to pull off. And we got two full-time staff members, two part ones, one of them only being paid, we got full-time jobs. We got Mike Lair, who just works himself like a dog and is holding this building together. He's pretty much taken this whole basement. When you go downstairs, that whole basement... It's all Mike. All Mike. And so here's, a, here, here, here's where you come in, okay? Here's, 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 here's the thing for you. I want to invite you. I want to invite you to 
inconvenience yourself for something greater than yourself. I want to invite you to inconvenience yourself for something greater than yourself. And I know, I know that that's a lot to ask of you. And I know, I, gosh, look, I, I hear this all the time. My parents, my parents get on to me all the time. Yes, I am almost 36 years old here in a few weeks, and, and my parents still get on to me, okay? And here's what the thing my parents get on to me about. You're doing too much. That's what my parents tell me. You guys are doing too much. How can a church your size? You are not that big of a church. You have like a budget of like $200,000, and you're probably doing more than X church down the street with like a $5 million budget, okay? Your people, you don't have that many people, okay? You guys are doing too much. And I go, I know, Mom, do leave me alone. <laughs> and I know, I get it. It's labor intensive. And I'm nuts, and I'm never satisfied, and I'm always thinking about, well, let's do the new thing. Hey, we did one affordable Christmas shop. Let's do two, okay? I know I'm crazy. I know I know it's all this stuff, all right? But here's the thing, okay? Participating in the kingdom of Jesus requires sacrifice. Just does. And here's the thing I promise you. If you partner with us, here's the thing I can promise you. No flogging, okay? No flogging. No flogging. You will not be beat, okay? I promise you. No scars or anything, all right? Unless it's a, a tattoo that you voluntarily take, okay? But no flogging. But seriously, I want you to think about this for just a second, okay? I know that what we do, it's very labor-intensive. It requires a lot of sacrifice. Here we are going to two services, and, you know, people got to get here early, and we're asking our children's volunteers to serve not once a month, but every other week and stuff. And I know for some, Pastor Kerry has told me, hey, look, I'm losing a couple of volunteers because it's just too much. They can't serve every other week and all this stuff. I, I understand all of that, and I, and I get it. But, 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 but seriously, just for a minute, is the sacrifice that is required of you in 2023 even close to the sacrifice that those apostles made? Participating in the kingdom of Jesus requires sacrifice. It just does. Trust me, I get it. I'm a pastor's kid. And my dad, for some reason, was only called to plant churches and boys and girls clubs and all kinds of places. And then here came along, and as long as I fought it, he called me to plant churches too. And here I've been in auditoriums and school gyms and everything else. I get it. I'm waiting for the day where God calls me to a $5 million facility where I could just walk in and turn the lights on. But he hadn't done it yet, and I don't think he plans to. For some reason, this is what God has called me to do. And it requires sacrifice. And I know what we're asking of you requires sacrifice as well. But here's the thing. Do you see what you lose as a loss or as a badge of honor? Because I even had to check myself on this. I'll be honest with you. I'll open up to you. There was a moment where it was like, oh, geez, we got to go to two services. Oh, man. Okay. I already get up at 6.30. Okay, so I'm going to have to get up. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to lose so much sleep. Blah, blah, blah. And seriously, God checked me for a moment because I started to go through this wowsy, wowsy, woo-woo thing. And then all of a sudden, God was like, excuse me? Excuse me? You have to go to two services or you get to go to two services? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Is this too much for you? Because I'll gladly use somebody else if you like. And I said, I'm sorry, Jesus. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't have to. I get to. I understand, Lord. I understand. And here's the thing. I know this is a lot. I know this is crazy. But here's the thing. It's your time. It's your time. When we started this 11 years ago, when we started this 11 years ago, Kate and I flew from Nebraska there's a firehouse on Cherry Street. They have a community meeting room. We met a group of people there. The Wares were there. The Dillos were there. The Little Wares were there. There were uh, a lot of people there, and we got together, and we just shared our hearts. Why in the world would we do this? And the thing that we came up together with is that our community here in Lincoln County needed a church that wasn't like every other church. We needed a church that was different. We needed a church that presented the gospel in such a way that people leaned in instead of leaning back. 
We thought that we needed a church that didn't keep the church hostage from the next generation, but willingly passed the baton to the next generation. We thought we needed a church that didn't sit around in a Sunday school classroom debating about when the end of the world was going to come, but instead have a church that realized that Jesus was coming back soon, we don't have much time, and we had better reach the lost. And here's the thing. Those people who started that with me, the Kunzas, the Wares, and the Dillos, this church was built on their backs. It was their money. It was their time. It was their sacrifice. And every single week, every single week in Bond Phil's Auditorium, whether it was Bond Phil's Auditorium or it was here or it's Liberty Christian, they would show up early, set up, not because we were expecting a big crowd, but set up and give our very, very best, waiting for the day that you walked into the room. Every speech I gave was, it's all about the one. It's all about the one. It's all about the one. And we were always waiting on you when you walked in the room that you felt home, that you felt like it was a a church for people who didn't like church, that it felt like a place you could belong, a place you could connect with, a place where you could give yourself to. We gave our all for 11 years straight every single Sunday. And it was their sacrifice and their time and their money that made this all possible. Now it's your time. And here's the amazing thing. If everyone will do a little, we can do a lot. If everyone will do a little, we can do a lot. Now, let me tell you something you don't know. And you know when I get the stool out, it's serious, okay? (laughs) So this is serious, okay? Here's what you don't know. Every single Sunday or Wednesday night, here's what will happen. There will be a woman who will walk into our church, and she will either be a single mother or her husband refuses to come to church with her for whatever reason. And she will bring her children, and she will take her kids to our kids' department, and she will check them in, and then she will come in this room, and she will sit in one of these seats, and she will pray that she doesn't get a text message that her kid is crying and wants to leave. She will sit there and she will pray that when she goes and picks up her kids and she asks them, did you have a good time? They'll say, yes, can we come back next week? She is sitting there and she is praying that we will get it right because when she comes here, she feels like God is speaking to her and she wants to be able to come back next week. But in order for that to happen, we have to get it right with those kids. And then the next week, another woman will walk in and she will finally convince her husband to come to church. She will finally convince her husband to finally walk into the room. She will use some sort of crazy excuse to get him here. She'll say, man, they got free Starbucks. They got donuts. They're doing popsicles this Sunday. He's talking about sex. I mean, just please, just please, (laughs) please come. And they will walk in this room, and they will sit down, and she will say a prayer. Please, God, please, God, help him to find something that he enjoys about this place, something that will at least want him to come back. Maybe it'll be the loud music. Maybe it'll be the free coffee. Maybe it'll be the fact that everybody's dressed down in jeans, and he's not the only one with tattoos. Like, I just help him to find something. And then she'll sit there a little longer and she'll pray a prayer, hoping that one of the other men in this room, one of the other men in this room, will walk up to him and give him a fist bump or a handshake just so he feels normal because she knows the entire time he's sitting there, he feels like a fish out of the water. He feels like everyone's judging him. He feels like everybody can see him. And she just wants him to fit in and belong. And then on Wednesday night, On Wednesday night, a mother will pull up in this parking lot, and her attitude will be, her teenager will be full of bad attitude. He'll say, do I really have to go? 
And all he wants to do or she do is stay at home and be on their phone, and they don't want to go. And they have been putting up a fight the entire day. And that mom is like, yes, you have to go. Give me your phone. Please go inside. And that teenager will slam the door, say I hate you, walk into these church doors, and then that mother will sit in that parking lot for a second, and she'll pray a prayer. And she'll say, Father God, please help my child to find a friend tonight because I know they don't have many friends. Father God, please, I hope that there's somebody there who earns my teenager's trust enough that they're willing to open up and share their thoughts and feelings because I know there's something going on, but they won't talk to me about it and I'm worried about them. Father God, please let there be someone in there who can earn their trust, who they're willing to open up to. Here's the deal. You have the potential to answer her prayer every single week. You have the potential to be the answer to someone's prayer. And I know, I know, I know you're all busy people. I get it. We're all busy. I know you're all very successful people. You have a lot going on, and you have so many different things. But this is what I'm asking of you. All I'm asking you for, all I'm asking you for is two hours. Which if you've never done the math and you don't know how many hours a week you have, you have 168 hours. If you give me two out of your 168 hours a week, some of the teams, I'll even put you on a rotation I can't even do the math that quick, but you could figure it out. But if you could just give me two hours, two hours, I will put you in the position to be an answer to somebody's prayer. And here's the thing. We believe that God has called us to a unique mission. I know it's labor intensive. I know it's hard. I know it's work. I know it's going to require sacrifice and loss of sleep and, and all of that stuff. I, I know it, it can be a burden. But here's the thing. We feel like God has called us to do something that nobody else is doing. We feel like we are aware and that we genuinely care about a genu generation that not everybody genuinely cares about, especially in the church. And we are all about reaching people and inspiring people to follow Christ by engaging them with the life and the mission of the church. And we believe that God has called us to a specific mission to, 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 to inspire everybody, but specifically to pass the baton to the next generation and to help this generation with the problems that they have and the challenges that they're, they're, they're dealing with. And we need your help. And we believe that what we have to offer here on Sunday mornings and in our groups and in our youth program, you can't find it anywhere else. I know your teens and your children are involved in a lot of stuff, but I'm telling you right now, if you aren't bringing your kids to church on Sunday and you aren't bringing your teens to Wednesday night youth, you are doing them a huge disservice. And just to warn you a little bit, some of you, you don't have much more time left to influence them. Some of you, you've got six years or less to be an influence on their faith journey. And then they're young adults, and then they're going to do whatever they want to do. The time is ticking away. And we believe, we believe that Jesus can make their life better and make them better at life. And I want to show you my new favorite picture. I actually I just, just hung it at the top of those stairs this morning. I had to get it printed. This was us at the back to school bash. And here you see this line of people, line of people who got there 40 minutes early, wanting to get a book bag, wanting to get their hair cut, wanting to get a glitter tattoo. And it was time to open, and I, this was totally unplanned. I didn't know what to do, but I was like, all right, everybody come in. And I see everybody, I see all my friends, and I see all these people, and of course I start crying like I always do. And I didn't know what to do. I just thanked everybody for being there. And I didn't know what to do next. So I just said, all right, everybody's hands in the middle. And here we are with all of our hands in the middle. And we said, all right, anchored hope on three. Here's the thing. I need your hands in the middle with me, okay? I need your hands in the middle. 
And my, I need you to partner with us. I need you to be in for next gen. I need you to help us inspire the next generation. And, and here's the thing. This is the last thing I'll say, and I'll let you go get popsicles, right? <laughs> Which would be real awkward because you'd be like, oh, geez, that was a heavy one, right? Okay. But here's the thing. <laughs> my prayer for every single one of you And some of you, you've already had this moment, okay? You already get this. But my prayer is that for every single one of us, at some point, we will understand the words of Jesus when he said this. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And then he said this. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me, we'll find it. And my prayer for you, for every single one of us, is that one day we will come to the realization, I came here to fill up my cup, but then I realized I'm actually here to empty it. That one day, You realize, I came to church because I was looking for something. I came to church because there was something missing in my life. I came to church because I needed something. But we all come to that point in time where we realize, oh, I get it now. What it means to follow Christ, when he said, pick up my cross and follow him, he wasn't just talking about adding a new necklace to my chain set. He was talking about dying to myself, losing my life to save my life. And then it all made sense. I came here to fill up my cup, but what I'm actually here to do is to empty it for the sake of others. And then you understand, oh, I get it. It's all for my betterment, but it's not about me. It's all for my betterment, but I get it now. This is not about me. And here's the thing, if you will partner with us, if you will help us, if you will join us on the mission, if you will be here consistently, by God's grace and your help, we can change the world. I believed that 11 years ago, and I believe that even more so today. That by God's grace and your help, We will not lose the next generation. In a world, in a culture today where churches are closing and churches are decreasing and our country is becoming less Christian and everybody's like, it's the end, it's wowsy, wowsy, woo woo. I go to places and I go, it is not true here at Anchored Hope. Because we are not losing. We are on the front lines and we are winning. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to call me. I want you to text me, which my wife said, don't put your cell phone number on. (laughs) That's on YouTube now, Michael. (laughs) I said, that's how I met you. Are you kidding me? That's. (laughs) I did. Livy Livy goes, how'd you meet mom? I said, honey, it was freshman orientation weekend of college, and there was a volleyball tournament, and I literally made a sleeveless shirt that said, I'm single. Here's my number. So I said, come on. This, is, this has always worked out for me. But seriously, I want you to text me. I want you to call me. And I want you to tell me I'm all in. Yeah? I'm all in. What do you need? Because you could be the answer to that prayer on our first impressions team. You could be the answer to that prayer by leading a youth small group. You could be an answer to that prayer by serving in the back with the children. And guess what? We're going to two services. So you don't even have to miss church. You just serve one hour and go to church the next. All works out. I know it requires sacrifice, but I need you. Let me pray for you. Father God, thank you. Thank you for using us. Thank you for taking us in that small meeting room on Cherry Street 11 years ago and for just giving us a vision and for using us to inspire people to follow Jesus. God, 
I look forward to the next 11 years and the next 11 years after that. And I look for all the places you will ask us to plant churches and to do ministry and to inspire people. And God, would we all this morning understand that there comes a point where we realize it's really not about me. It's about how I can give myself. It's how I can jump on my cross. It's how I can follow you. And it's all for my betterment, but it's not about me. So will you teach us that we came here to fill our cup, but really what it means to follow you is to empty our cup for the sake of others. And it's through that that I learn how to love God, how to love others, and how to truly love myself, God. God, we love you. We thank you. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. Well, hey, I'm so glad that you were here, and I knew I would preach a little long, so there's no last song, so some of you can't sneak out, so, uh, but I'm glad you're here, and I hope that downstairs, you go downstairs, enjoy some popsicles, spend some time. Have a great Labor Day weekend. We'll see you online, and then we'll see you back here on the 10th.